So what I shall try to do today is give you some idea on what I shall be talking about, where does it come from, how did it originate, and what are some ideas behind it, and what is, what is more or less the state of the art at the moment. I have a set of slides here because my computer, I could not recompile the thing. So a set of slides that still mention another lecture I gave on the same topic in, in Austin after the Torn conference that several of you were. Um, The whole idea actually started in a rather funny way, and I kind of like to talk about that because to some extent it refers a little bit to the previous talk by Professor Zalamea, if I pronounce it well. Mm -hmm. um, there was a psychologist at the Free University of Brussels where I was teaching in those days. Actually, he was a, a medical doctor, but in the old times, medical doctors often taught psychology. They didn't know anything about it, but that was they were what they were talking. Uh, at least in many universities in Belgium and France. So he taught the, this man, Jean-Pierre de Waale, had the idea, what we do not understand and what we do not grasp when we look at the history of the sciences is the dynamics of scientific concepts. And of course, there is an, a proposal to understand this, namely the tradition of Kant and Hegel, and then later at a societal level, uh, the tradition of Marx. And so he organized a little group, and the idea was how can we what can we say about inconsistencies in relation to dynamics? And since I had done some work on paraconsistency, I was given the task to figure it out for, from a logical point of view, look at, at uh, proofs and see, check what happens in a proof if an inconsistency is derived. What can you do? What kind of approach can you follow at that moment? So this is a rather special position. The idea is not to be about, to talk about inconsistencies, but rather to talk about inconsistencies as means to understand scientific dynamics, the evolution of concepts and the evolution of theories and of knowledge in general. So, Something came out of that, a kind of working paper originally in Dutch. And then it turned out that in that period, Grand Priest and Richard Radley were collecting papers for a book that had been planned for a long time. It's a big black book. There are several contributors to that book in, in the room here. Um, it appeared in an unfortunate place namely the publisher went bankrupt two years later or a year later and uh, so good i have been looking at handling inconsistency i thought there were some good and new ideas in the matter and i should type up the paper and send it to grand priest who might expect her to be here today but apparently he didn't, yes, didn't show up Thursday. He arrives on Thursday. Okay. Um, now, people have different ways of entering to problems. And my way to entering, I come from a kind of, uh, from a tradition that tries to look at concrete stuff. And proofs, of course, are something concrete. Proofs are finite sequences of formulas and so on and so on, all the noun definitions. And fortunately, there are several definitions for task logics. And then, uh, so 
as the, the rather nominalistic tradition, whereas if I suppose Grand Priest will give one of the lectures later, next week or so, uh, but then you will see that he approaches problems always from a model theoretic point of view, which is, of course, much more abstract, includes many more infinities and so on and so on. So these are different ways of looking at things. And uh, it's, it's not a matter of, it's, it's not a difference in opinion on what is important or what is correct or not correct, but it leads to different approaches and different solutions. Now, this thing I started talking about led to a kind of way to handling consistency. So, think literally about you are reasoning and then in that reasoning you stumble upon an inconsistency. And then what do you do? I still think the wise thing to do is to try to get rid of the inconsistency. And I think you can show, Grand Priest doesn't believe that, but I think you can show that if you are able to retain the same information, but transform your inconsistent description to a consistent one, then the new description will be superior. It will be richer. It will well, grasp the situation better and so on. Now, when that thing started marching, um, we started looking. Of course, you first find such an inconsistency, adaptive logic, as I now like to call it. Originally, I, this is an anecdote, I'm sorry. Originally, I called it dynamic dialectical logics, the paper. It was a kind of way to be rather cynical about um, 20 year older paper by Rowdley and Meyer that was called static, static, sorry, static, um, static dialectical logics, which I think is a kind of contradictory in terminus. If it's static, it's not dialectic. Anyway. But now I prefer to call these things inconsistency adaptive logics for reasons you will soon see. So a number of young people that were taking a PhD with me were kind of pushing uh, and telling me you should generalize this thing because the structure of this approach can be used in for example, in order to understand and get a grasp on uh, abduction or inductive generalization or finding a good explanation and stuff like that. Because mainly Joko Meijer, some people know her, who was behind that pushing. And in the beginning, I was a bit skeptical, and uh, then I started giving in and uh, trying to change and generalize the thing. And it seemed, it turned out that it worked. And moreover, it gave the hope after a while, the hope that this approach of this kind of uh, rather funny logics that have dynamic proofs, for example, unlike Tusky logics, Tasky logics I always mean logics that are reflexive, transitive, and uh, monotonic. So here you need dynamic proofs. And the hope was that this would capture all forms of defeasible reasoning. Now, what is defeasible reasoning? It's typically a kind of reasoning that in which you, you are reasoning, you think at this point I can draw a conclusion. You draw the conclusion, and then going on, you get, of course, you draw more conclusions, you get better insights 
into the premises in what they state. And then you realize that you have to withdraw or you have to remove the conclusion that you have drawn before. So this is typically a form of uh, defeasible reasoning. Think about inductive generalization, that's very simple. As long as all the crowds you see are black, you can keep up, all crowds are black. It's sufficient that you see one crow that has a different color and you have to throw away your generalization, okay? So you see things better. It doesn't matter whether the new idea comes later, then it's non-monotonic, or whether the new the, the, the idea of, say, this blue crew crow was already in from the very beginning, but you didn't see it. Uh, I will, in the first, in the, uh, tomorrow I will explicitly go in on that. The difference between non-monotonicity and getting insights in the premises, which may lead to very similar things, even if they are very different, of course. Um, and actually, it turned out that this thing seemed to work. But then the problem was whenever you try to apply to a new form of defeasible reasoning, this general technique, you had again to provide new proofs, completeness proofs, to show that your syntax and your semantics coincide, lead to the same conclusions, and proofs of the properties of your uh, of, of the logics you have. But in the end, the proofs all are similar to the ones we had before, like the ones on handling and consistency. So then the idea was, let us try to form a general, kind of general characterization. And uh, we called it the standard format. So the idea is now to approach an, uh, a defeasible reasoning, a form of defeasible reasoning, to approach it as a triple, which I will also explain tomorrow what it consists of and how it works. And then once you define it in terms of such a triple, you have the rules for your dynamic proofs, you have the semantics, and you have, in generic terms, again, the completeness proofs and the proofs of all the properties you need. So in that sense, the standard format is extremely strong and powerful. I wanted at least to mention the relation with the work of Da Costa, uh, which I did not see from the very beginning or did not see very clearly, but became clearer later on. In a sense, Da Costa tried to do something similar, namely, as we will see tomorrow, the, the idea, the approach I tried to implement was to, to say, let us consider, for example, inconsistencies as abnormalities, things that are normally false. And then check what happens if we interpret a premises set as consistently as possible, which I think is sensible, a sensible approach, for example, with respect to the history of the sciences. But Acosta allowed to do this from his very first papers on paraconsistency, the CN logics, in the sense that he left open the possibility that you would state this or that sentence as consistent, because you can express consistency in his CN systems. And there is even, but that's something I only found later and then talked about it, I think, in, Parati was the idea that if adding consistency claims about certain sentences to the original theory, if things go wrong, if you kind of overreached or overdrew your hand, 
then you can still move up to a higher numbered logic. So you start with, say, classical logic, which is like C0. And then if you get the inconsistencies from your premises, uh, then you go to C1. That kind of takes away you know, the problems you have at that moment. And then you can move to C2, C3, and so on and so on. And always try it again. Of course, the approach is very different. Um, I think the, the, my attention was drawn to it, especially because in those days, Joao Marcos was for half a year or so in Ghent. And uh, of course, he was rather liking to defend the Da Costa approach and to attack mine, which is always very useful because you learn a lot from that. If somebody says this is nonsense, well, then you try to show that it is not nonsense. And if you succeed, then you have learned something. Okay, and you can write another paper. Okay. So there were, of course, influences. One of the influences was Da Costa. Uh, I think, on the other hand, that um, Joao Marcos' his PhD uh, led to the whole thing, the whole conglomerate of papers now and books on, on logics of formal inconsistency. Um, and so, at least, I tend to hope that Joao, during the period he was in Ghent, was to some extent also influenced uh, for his PhD in the sense that our perspective, the Gantt perspectives, gave him certain problems that he would have to approach in a different way from uh, in terms of logics of formal inconsistency. And so I hope that there was some mutual influence between the Brazilian school and the this funny group of people around me in those days. So what I'm going to do in the, in the following days is first give a rather simple example of how inconsistency can be handled and why this is a natural way to approach it. Namely to when you reach an inconsistency, not to say, oh, that's great, we have shown that knowledge is inconsistent or the world is inconsistent, but rather say, how can we get rid of the inconsistency? Can we move to a consistent replacement theory? And then from there on, move on. And of course, the, the point is, what, what are the things we have to be careful about? That's what what such a study can reveal. What do you have to do? How do you approach getting to an, a less inconsistent theory or possibly a consistent one? So I shall first try to show that, then I shall move to this generalization, but I shall do it at once to save some time in terms of the standard format. I give a description, generic description at the level of syntax and semantics, and then mention some of the meta theory. That's all in the slides, there's no problem. And then, of course, at the end, I will have to come to the question, are there any open problems? And of course, yes, there are some open problems. Otherwise, the world would stop turning around. So, but I'm not going to, to tell you what they are here. One of the good things is that at the moment, there are, there is in the mathematics department in Ghent with Andreas Feierman, that is a professor of logic in the Faculty of Sciences. There is a Russian uh, research professor, and there is another one very likely coming there. 
So there will be two. These guys are fluent in things like complexity of theories because these inconsistency adaptive logics lead to extremely complex consequence sets. For people familiar with it, pi 1, 1 complex consequence set, sets, which some people think to be a disaster. But on the other hand, it's an advantage because you are able, by means of something that resembles very much a traditional notion of a theory, namely a set of non-logical axioms, and then a logic, in this case, an, an adaptive logic, you are able to characterize very complex theories that you cannot, you can easily show that you cannot characterize them by means of tasky logics. Because then, of course, the consequence sets have to be much simpler. So the last point is that I will handle those uh, still open problems, and they are related to some extent to the complexity of combining adaptive logics, because you can do certain things with this adaptive logic, especially I have a little bit of work on um, say creativity and problem solving more in general. And if you try to approach a period in the history of the sciences and try to characterize it in terms of logic, sequence of logics that build one on top of the other, then of course you will at some point when you are not able to explain something, you will look for an extension of your theory. In order to do that, you will have to look for more data and then you will need the logic of inductive generalization and in this way, maybe find an, a ge more general hypothesis that will enable you to explain the data you couldn't explain before. And so, from that point of view, what you need is a kind of sequence of adaptive logics, one on top of the other. And one of the interesting stuff the interesting points about it is that it can be shown that the uh, if you do this in terms of adaptive logics, as I suggested, then you can still demonstrate that the development of theories that will follow are content laden or content guided, as some people call it. Basically, Shapiro, if you remember. D sorry, Dudley Shapiri. Shapiri with an E in the end. He was the one that stressed in the 20th century this idea of content guidance and content laden. So it should not be something like the Vienna Circle attempted, namely, if we apply logic, then we will understand sciences. Because, of course, this you, ca you cannot, you see beforehand that you cannot expect, or you see with hindsight that you cannot expect too much from that. Because it will not sufficiently depend on the specific properties of your theory and the specific problems you have in it. It, it will just claim to be a kind of general purpose. Uh, like an, a hammer to knock all nails in any wall, which is, of course, completely nonsense. Okay, maybe I, I hope I can help the organizers by stopping here. Uh, because my idea was just to announce what I will do in the following lessons, and then I will follow the transparency because now I didn't use it at all. Okay, but you you see, you can see here, I can also. Um, one of the reasons why I talked about this dynamics in the beginning and connecting it to creativity is that the approach is very different from the 20th century approach in the philosophy of science. There, the central figure is Tom Nichols from 
uh, the United States. Um, and Tom Holt phrases it in terms of questions, so answering questions in a sense. And then a number of other people working on questions have followed that line of thought. For example, Anze Wisniewski from now Poznan, who has tried to do things that help one to kind of implement the kind of reasoning you need in order to uh, arrive at, at new knowledge or at creative knowledge. So I think this idea of Jean-Pierre de Waal that I mentioned was interesting in the sense that it did not anticipate but deviated at somewhere in the first half of the 20th century already from what would follow later, which is sometimes a good thing. I think I will give the floor back to the organizers, if the organizers agree with that. Uh, maybe one, a, a few warnings. I've only one in my head at the moment, but several may come up. These adaptive logics are really logics that adapt themselves to premise sets. The the person applying the logic need not do anything, need not reason in a certain way. Uh, the logic adapts itself, and I will show even tomorrow how that works fine, I think. The disadvantage of the whole thing is that it is computationally not extremely interesting. So logics of formal consistency, for example, are computationally more interesting. In the sense that if you want to find your replacement theory, you can use an adaptive logic in, in, in order to define it, say, let us interpret this as consistent as possible, and then afterwards we will see that we can eliminate some inconsistencies. But, of course, the logic of formal inconsistency is computationally more interesting in the sense that in this logic, you will take steps by declaring certain formulas consistent. You may make mistakes, which here cannot happen in the sense that you go for a maximum. Uh, so in logical formula consistency, you can make a mistake, but you can take a withdrawal. And as I mentioned, in connection with Acosta CN logics, you can move to the next higher logic in order to Repair. If you understand, if you saw that you made a mistake, then you can repair it. So the adaptive logics do it at the level of defining consequence set, but referring to a maximum, a maximally normal interpretation. Okay. So, and then I claim and you knock on my head the next days if it is not true. If this, if, well, I promise that it will all be simple and very understandable. Because the, the whole meta theory really shows that it is simple and very understandable, the whole thing. And if it works, which I cannot promise because you, you have to wait a couple of centuries before that, but if it works to capture all forms of the feasible reasoning that would make life quite interesting, I think. Because the feasible reasoning is extremely interesting. Most reasoning that people make is the feasible. Uh, deductive logic is applied in courts of law in handbooks of physics or mathematics or sociology or whatever. Uh, whereas all knowledge ultimately goes back on the feasible reasoning. That's definitely the case for empirical sciences, but I would also claim it's the case for mathematics. Think about uh, Lakatos's work on proofs and refutations. 
where it shows that yeah, sometimes people advance things and then it turns out that it is a mistake and you try to repair it. So even in mathematics, this form of divisible reasoning plays a rather important and central role. Okay, and now I, I shall really stop. Okay. The audience is much too kind. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. So we have some break now up to 5.45. So we have to be here sharply at 5.45. Oh, we, we can, do we accept questions now? Or questions. Tomorrow? Okay, two questions. Questions. I always accept questions, and there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid asks. <laughs> Please. Sorry, as we have time now, I will ask you to identify, to present yourself, your name and where are you from, because we would like to, to, to know everybody. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Galicia from Mexico. I study um, adaptive logics from uh, the patents. And my question is the next. Okay. Yes, please take the argument for some help in order to play the, the question. La lógica, usted, al entrar a lógica adaptativa dentro de alguna familia, alguna tradición lógica. Can you, can you repeat? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see adaptive logics in a family? As part of a family of logics, some traditions? I think that's one of the open problems in the sense that uh, I would like to generalize many things, like this notion of a dynamic proof, for example. Now it's just static proofs and, say, tasky proofs and then dynamic proofs. But I would like to have more a continuum that includes more forms of, of proofs. And the similar things for logics. I think there, there, are, there are a number of logics that may be in between. I like continua in general. I think that one of the funny things about logicians is that if they have a problem and they find a solution, then they say, this is it, and that's, that's the correct reasoning behind it. Which, of course, is nonsense. If you continue thinking a little bit, you find alternatives. You see, we can do it in com very completely different ways. And the different ways are not necessarily worse. And why would they be less correct as forms of reasoning? So in that sense, I, I think your, I like your question very much. But it's still an open problem. Well, I believe that the answer is we need more. But the problem is to work it out, of course. We don't have more theories okay. at the moment. Thanks. For the questions, maybe somebody can. I don't know how far this goes. <laughs> I'm afraid it's finite. Maybe <laughs> 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 it's even shorter than finite. Thanks. Uh, so you said? Hello. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm Daniele. I'm a PhD student in, uh, in philosophy at Lincoln University in Hong Kong. Um, so you said that knowledge is, is uh, defeasible. All knowledge is defeasible. I found that quite surprising because a lot of people think that knowledge is factual so if if a subject knows that p then p is true but then the feasible knowledge would entail that truth is can change which it seems mm -hmm. against my yes. thank you thanks uh well this whole simplistic british way of reducing knowledge to true belief I've never liked it, and I think it is rather nonsensical. 
what it what it tells you is something about the commitment when you utter the phrase this is a true sentence then that gives you the commitment to defend the sentence as true or to, to defend the sentence you should be committed to that wouldn't that be certainty sorry wouldn't that be certainty i'm certain that he would look like that whereas well, why do we have a different verb then knowledge and research. oh we have many different verbs and, and adverbs for many things fair enough i think that's And then I think also this idea of knowledge as true belief led to a kind of rather dogmatic view on science. It's all, and I think the previous speaker may agree with this, it's very typical unit perspective. You look at one thing, and if you look at the history of science, it's very different. The concepts change all the time. So how can you, if the concepts even change, how can truth remain stable? Okay? If, if you talk in terms of medieval approaches to medicine, these things in our eyes are complete nonsense. They are full of references to things that don't exist or think even in chemistry about things like phlogiston and so on and so on. Okay? So is, is a statement about phlogiston, can it be true or not? I would rather think it cannot be true because we do not, it, it has presuppositions that we do not believe anymore. And it was true back in the days. I don't think so. <laughs> no, that's the way people thought it could be best put. So they were certain that phlogiston was such and such, but it wasn't true. They may have been as certain as they wanted, but I would not call it true. Right. Because they didn't have knowledge yeah. uh, about phlogiston. Right. Thanks. So it's a, a pessimistic meta-induction about truth itself. It's like Laudan's pessimistic Well, I, I know the idea has been launched many times, but you said meta-induction about truth, right? I think the idea has been launched many times, but I do not know of anybody that really worked it out and showed that it, that it did what it should do. I think it's just claims as philosophers often put. They claim things. And the more they repeat it, the more people think that they are right or that it is true. Sounds right. I know so how I've repeated many times that all knowledge is relative in, well, not relativistic, but relative in the sense that what you call knowledge in a certain period depends on the number of pragmatic conditions about that period, what the best theories are in that period, and so on and so on. So can, we, can we call it just information? Yeah, but how does that solve the problem? I mean, you can call it information, but then you have information that, how can you explain that information? Well, then you have to admit that information can become useless over the time when the concepts change, for example. The information is not... It becomes useless or, or puzzling or at least uninformative. Uh, but think about all those non-existing entities. There is this beautiful paper by Larry Loudon, the confutation of uh, convergent epistemological realism. He has, there, is, there is one version that has confutation and the other has another word, maybe refutation. And he gives a very long list of entities that played a very central role in the history of the sciences, but don't play any role at all in, in contemporary science, are considered to be non-existent. Okay, then usually they tell the story about the Malade Imaginaire the, by, by Molière, where the guy, the, the, medical, the medic explains that the guy is all the time asleep because he has too much vis dormitiva. Okay, so it's the, the, the sleeping power 
is too much present in this person. Then there was a time that people connected all kind of bodily forms to your character. It's about of the same level as connecting your astrological antecedents to your character. But well, if we have, the, I mean, a, a degree of uh, explanation there, I mean. Oh sure, yes. It was still information. I mean, probably yeah. holds. Yeah, and uh, and the fact that that this connection between the form of your body and your character is does not hold, I think is is not something principle, because it is quite possible that there would be a relation between the two. There's nothing wrong with it, just as it would be possible that depending on the period of the year you are born in, you would have a different character. I was born in November, so I've mainly seen winter months, okay, and moreover I was born in, in 44, uh, so and I was in Berlin, so there were bombardments every four days. That doesn't make your parents extremely optimistic, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that has an influence on your character. So I, but by the way, I was not there because my parents had any sympathy for the Nazis, but my father was a forced laborer in Germany. Until the day he died, he got a pension from the Germans for the years he worked there. But this is, of course, just because, well, I know several people misinterpret me and I sometimes say, well, if I may ask a delicate question, there's nothing delicate about it. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? I have one more question. Well, does, does this, this sort of a pessimistic view of knowledge refer to refers to proofs, like for instance, the proof of Pythagorean theorem apparently remains valid since thousands of years, right? He seems to be resisting to this revisability. For instance, no, well, but yeah, the proof remains valid in, in Euclidean geometry. Only. Yeah. Only. Only, not what in the arithmetic. <laughs> no, no, but of course, I mean, given the fact that you accept certain points that you start from, you can continue reasoning. On the other hand, it is possible that you, well, what happened in the 19th century was to some extent that people start realizing that, unlike what Kant still claimed, Euclidean geometry is not the only way we are able to understand spatial relations in. You can just as well do it, and that is very strong. I mean, because we know that these three geometries are have models in each other. So if one is consistent, the others are also consistent. Okay, okay but it does not cancel the previous proofs. You have more proofs, you have more geometry. It wasn't revised. But it's new that you have now a different notion of a straight line, even of a point. Um, uh, you cannot you cannot draw a triangle on, on, on a ball. Something that has the Euclidean triangle properties of triangles, such a thing you cannot draw on, on a ball. So certainly you need a plane for that. Yeah, but so you got new insights in this way. And in a sense, things change because, well, the, this 19th century upcome, the, 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 the fact that um, Riemann goes around and this Riemannian geometry gave us new a new view on geometry. It's not just and other views that were added, it just add some of our, some of the geometrical notions as we had them in the beginning of the 19th century were a bit simplistic. Just as, as Gödel's theorem shows that the views we had before were very naive. It's only from Gödel on that we realize that there is a difference between mathematical truth and calculability. 
okay? Before people thought if something is true, well, then you can, you can calculate. Well, you're right, but it proves by Euclidus that there are infinity of many prime numbers still resist. But what, what, what I think is, is not correct in what you say is that you are arguing things that we now know in the 21st century. But if you are told those things to the guy from the beginning of the 19th century, he would have probably put you in jail if he was powerful enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, there are examples like that, right? People were usually put in jail, like the, the guy that wrote a poem of the Tiforal has been in jail for 30 years or 20 years or so. It was Frederick II of Prussia had to intervene with his local baron or whatever it was to free him. So uh, these things happen. And uh, so I think in a lot of, in the history of, of mathematics, a lot of important changes come from the fact that we see that there are alternatives to the former theories. Sure. And of course, now we know this, we, we agree all about it. So in that sense, you what you claim is not, uh, what you claim is laden a little bit with present-day insights. Now, suppose you are told it to Aristotle, I think he would have done something to you. <laughs> okay. Maybe according to some contexts, to some special theory, there are results that do not need revisions for a long time. The question by Walter, uh, why don't you need to, 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 why don't you need a revision concerning Pythagoras' uh, mm -hmm. theorem, for instance? From the point of view of Euclidean geometry, until now, it was not necessary any revision. Until now. Until nowadays. Maybe certain results do not need revision, any revision. But this is not a problem for adaptive logics. You are not claiming that every but, sentence, yeah. every proof. No, but I think this relates to the fact that all knowledge is ultimately defeasible. And uh, uh, I think we learned from this 19th century geometrical modifications. There are two more questions high up there, but I think the idea was really that you should come down a little bit and grab the microphone to present yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Thank you. Next part of your talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I am from South Korea, and I, my name is Chesna, and a lecturer at the University of Seoul. And um, my question is that when you say that most reasoning is defeasible, um, I don't actually the meaning of those sentences because um, I think that it, it is true that um, we can find some common example to some validity of reasoning maybe, uh, but and sometimes someone thinks that some someone has a different meanings of validity, so. Uh, when you say most of reasoning is defeasible, means that um, maybe you claim some kind of nihilistic claim to the logical reasoning some or kind of a logical nihilism. Kind of there is no uh, validity or there is no black body. So mm. you, you may have some other reason. I'm not going to sell out what I'm what I've been paid for my whole life. <laughs> Maybe there, there is some other criteria yeah. for that it would be. Yeah. yeah. Hey, just that, uh, I'm not sure what I should answer to it in the sense that uh, 
Maar je kunt zien, als je daar staat, er zijn certain things that do not need revision within a certain tradition, at least. Ja, yeah, but this holds for many things, also for funny things like uh, the, there was a period that, notwithstanding that at earlier days we knew better, there was a period that people believed that the earth was flat and that if you went to the end, you would fall off. Okay. Uh, the whole thing that, that the fire arm describes, namely that if you drop the, the so-called Galilea experiment, if you drop a stone from a tower and the earth would move, then the stone, the stone is bound to get to the ground 200 meters from the tower. There are people that thought this was a good argument to show that the earth did not turn. And uh, at some point, I was in Poland at some point a long time ago, uh, and uh, this crazy Oxford, no, not Oxford, Cambridge, Cambridge professor, the madam, as some people called her, was there, Mrs. Anscombe. And she said that in the newspaper of just the week before this conference, there had somebody argued that if you would jump up then and the earth would turn around and then you would end up at the end of the piece of land and things like that. So apparently there are still people that reason the wrong way for that reason, not knowing that. And you find many examples like that. Like there is a, a discussion between Dawkins and uh, Cardinal Pell. This this Australian cardinal is on, on the internet, and Pell argues against Dawkins, claiming that you cannot use natural selection and struggle for for survival and so on in order to found a morality. And Dawkins says, "I never did so. I use Darwinism to explain how." The species has evolved, not as a basis for, for, uh, for morality. That's, of course, nonsense. So, I mean, many people have mistaken illusions about what they think other people claim or, or said. And I think we should be very careful with that. Because if you want to build an... A, 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 Society that more or less survives, I think we have to be very careful and uh, make sure we have everybody with us, as we sometimes say, but there are no people staying behind. Or, well, it's an old idea again, of course, it's already in Hegel. Of course, if, if in a society where there are slaves, the masters are just as much, uh, well, are bad off just as much as the slaves, okay? Because if you survive because of a slave, then this is a problem for you. Of course, it's a different problem for the slave most of the time, but still. There, there were two people having a question. Of, yeah, no, sorry. At least I don't give you my own questions. So, oh, hi, uh, I'm Juan. Bear in mind, I'm a mathematician, so I probably don't know what I'm talking about. But um, when you said. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Um, so. You, talk, you said about uh, that knowledge is true belief, Is you, you don't agree with that. And I, um, I've always heard the other phrase that knowledge is justified belief. And justified true, true belief. Really? Uh, yeah. You need both. Justified true belief. Okay. Justified true belief. I, I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate on that because it, to my mind it seems that 
just as when when philosophers like to say that well something is true if it is the case it seems kind of redundant i don't know um when you talk about justification it seems to me that you have something concrete to, to grasp which is the justification you can argue with that so could could the, the idea of revision be related to how we justify our beliefs and how we review the ways in which do we well, I, I think that, and I give you that, I, I think the justified part is much more important than the true part. But uh, in order to talk about knowledge. So I once I had a lot of psychology students and I once wrote an, uh, a book, unfortunately it's in Dutch, and it has been translated in modern Greek, but that doesn't help you either. Uh, but um, then I try to especially use this idea of justification and also the idea of relative justification. What you consider a good justification depends on pragmatic factors. What are the accepted methods in your neighborhood and so on and so on. So, but maybe I think that's a good way to place it, that, that I think the justification is more important than the truth. I think now everybody is really, ah, so can, can you, I don't need, I'm Lukas Gret from Germany, and um, yeah, I have a remark to the final formula um, uh, that uh, the um, Pythagoras triangle formula uh, holds in geometry, and is it, isn't it a revision when you say it, it holds only in uh, Euclidean geometry? Or? Kind of that was the point I tried to make in a sense to Walter, namely that by the fact that we, we know that there are other ways to describe the world geometrically, geometrically, and there the Pythagoras theorem obviously does not hold. So I think this is a form of revisability. Hello, hi, Marco from the Paulo. I just want to, when you say all knowledge is repeatable, maybe we take it just too generally, just like every sentence, like it's a little bit, like the proof is divisible, that proof itself. I wanted you to elaborate a little bit on just how knowledge is divisible, because if you take, you talked a little bit about Lakatos and other, like in philosophy of science, when you take phlogiston, like for instance, you can't take these sentences about phlogiston and refute them. You take the entire theory and you get them. If you get the divisibility of the entire theory, or if you're going to get the geometry, you can't get the Pythagorean. I think that's the point. You can't get, I think, the, the proof itself divisible. You can get the, the Euclidean geometry itself for an entire, for a specific application and move away. And is that what you call the feasible bank? You can elaborate what exactly is the feasible. Because all knowledge, like, it's like the Proof itself can be divisible. I wanted to elaborate a little bit on that. No, I definitely agree to that. Uh, a traditional example, I think, is that in Belgium, people sometimes ask me, is it feasible that Brussels is the capital of Belgium? Then I usually tell them, well, what does capital means? Like, everybody will say that The Hague is the capital of, of the Netherlands. Okay, but actually it's not. In, in the same sense as in Belgium, the capital, their capital needs is the residence city. It's where the government and the king and so on reside in a sense. 
although the king lives in Amsterdam, uh, but he resides in The Hague, whatever that means. I don't know. I don't know nothing about kings. Good. <laughs> but that's the same point as, as you made now, okay? And, uh, so I agree completely with you.